What's up, guys? Welcome to a new episode of Big Riff Energy. It's Monday, March 6th. Uh, this was a big weekend for me. It was a big anniversary, um, and I wasn't going to talk about it, but for reasons that I can explain as we go along, I decided I need to talk about it. Uh, March 3rd, 2015, so eight years ago, I was uh, pouring a bottle of wild turkey down the toilet and out the door to go to detox. Uh, so March 4th, 2015 would be what's known as my sobriety date. But March 3rd was the most important day of my life because I made a decision not to die. And I don't really talk about this so much publicly anymore. In the early days of Spirit Adrift, every single interview I did, I had to talk about this. The music and that experience were so intrinsically linked, and still are, that it was pretty much unavoidable. And I don't mind talking about it, but it got a little old. Um, and in the last few years, I've, I've sort of started to look at it differently. I see people... Um, using sobriety or, or their experience with substance abuse and getting sober, or whatever it is. Some people, especially in this field, sort of had a, a tendency to use it as like so, to get social media points or like a pat on the back or whatever. And then there's other people that sort of come off with a vibe of superiority and then there's other people I, I sort of unfortunately maybe have a tendency to be this kind of person who when they're recounting their drinking and using and running wild days, it, there's sort of like an undercurrent of romanticizing it or glorifying it in a way. Um, so I sort of stopped talking about it, man. It also just got kind of old when you're trying to talk about music and that's like all anybody's asking you about. But the goal with this podcast is to be as real as possible. Um, just like the goal is for me when it comes to writing music. I want it to be honest. I want it to be sincere. I want it to be real, what I'm actually going through, what's on my heart. And I feel like if I glossed over this anniversary, it would be bullshit. There's a million podcasts where you can go like see somebody react to the new Metallica song or whatever. This is never going to be that. I'm never going to do anything to get views or clicks or whatever. I'm just, I'm here doing my thing. You know, the last few days, I, it was like unavoidable seeing videos of people I respect talking about sobriety. I saw one, uh, Jamie Lee Curtis talking about getting off of Vicodin. I saw a conversation with Russell Brand talking about sobriety, Steve-O. So it was just kind of like slapping me in the face that I needed to talk about this. And I think it'll serve a good purpose for, for me as well. Um, this is going to be the last time I talk about this publicly. And if it comes up again, I can just refer people back to this podcast episode. Um, but the main reason here, if three people listen to this and one person hears something that they need to hear, then it's worth talking about this. Um, because I think back to so many little seeds that were planted in my mind uh, that pretty much saved my life eventually, you know. So yeah, March 3rd, uh, first of all, thanks to everybody again who's been commenting and uh, sending emails and stuff. I'm going to tell this little story of how I almost killed myself uh, due to alcoholism. Um, then I'm going to answer a fan question I got which is cool. And then I'm going to talk about this Linda Ronstad record for a little bit. Uh, March 3rd, 2015, I was severely underweight, severely malnourished, um, totally riddled with dread, anxiety, uh, psychosis. You know, I was in the like full throes of alcohol induced psychosis, I have seen so many movies about like paranoid schizophrenic people, like a uh, beautiful mind, for instance, 
where you're just like, doesn't he know he's crazy? Can't, doesn't he remember that he has all these delusions and stuff? Why is he convinced that all this shit's real when he knows he has schizophrenia? Turns out when you're experiencing that kind of mental illness, you don't know. <laughs> you're completely convinced of whatever's going on. So that was scary. Um, my eyes were turning yellow. I've watched a couple people die of cirrhosis of the liver in real time. Um, which sucks really bad, but I'm grateful to those people, uh, because I was able to see what the terminal stage of that looks like. And I was in it. I was well into it. Um, so I'm going to just sort of go back to the beginning, tell a super condensed version of this. And if you don't want to hear about, you know, how I got sober and almost died and all that, this probably ain't the episode for you. Like I said, there's a million podcasts where you can watch somebody react to a Metallica song or whatever. Uh, but if you're curious about it, stick around. So it seems that the consensus these days is moving in the direction that um, addiction and alcoholism and stuff like that, there's a genetic component to it, but it's also maybe more directly related to trauma than doctors and scientists or whoever studies that sort of stuff originally thought. Uh, I'm sure I have both of those elements. I, I recognize in retrospect things in my personality that I think were genetically predetermined that seem to be correlated with getting addicted to drugs and alcohol and stuff like that. And I had a super overactive imagination. Um, I was really self-absorbed. Uh, that has a negative connotation, but I just mean I was like, always living in my own imagination and kind of in my own mind, you know? Uh, yeah, just a hyperactive imagination and a really vivid like internal world that I sort of used as a way to escape what was going on. And I think, <clears throat> like I said, that's genetic, but I think it was also a response to like pretty major childhood trauma that I went through, family tragedies and stuff like that. Um, I'm going to fast forward to when I first started drinking. I was pretty young and it started off just kind of sneaking liquor and stuff out of curiosity. And then I met some dudes in the neighborhood that were interested in drinking and rock and roll and stuff like that. And I, I think I was like 13 or 14 years old, somewhere around there. The first time I got good and drunk on whiskey. And all these feelings of uh, feeling not a part of anything. I, I just never felt like I fit in with anybody. Or I was always kind of like on the outside looking in. Uh, I was like real uh, self-conscious, but masking it with all sorts of different things, trying to pretend that I wasn't. And I think these are normal things for every kid to experience, but for some reason I just couldn't handle it. And the first time I got good and drunk on whiskey, that all went away. Every single problem that I had in my life, in my mind, internally, emotionally, whatever, it was gone. Gone. A total euphoria. I'll never forget that night. We were uh, <laughs> we were running around the neighborhood and we found this big like golden retriever just like built like a barrel and it was kind of red and golden. And we had this friend named Chad who was built the same way and had red hair. He wasn't there, but we named the dog Chad and we're just like running around with this random dog in the neighborhood, falling down hills and shit. It was amazing. It was an incredible experience. It was, it was like a cure for everything that was wrong with me. Uh, i read years later, Charles Bukowski wrote about <clears throat> getting drunk the first time and, how he knew that he was going to be doing that for the rest of his life because it just fixed everything. Um, talk about being able to identify with another alcoholic. When I read that years later, you know, come to find out that's not a good reaction <laughs> to have to alcohol or drugs. Um, you know, that went on to be pretty typical, like weekend teenage partying. 
uh, and it just progressed into more frequent and more intense, like escapism. Uh, me and my like tight unit of friends growing up in Oklahoma, we there weren't any bad dudes in that group of people. Uh, thank God we were all like raised right, pretty traditional like moral compass type of stuff, because we were all going through a lot of shit, man. Parents dying. Uh, divorce, like real stuff, addiction. <clears throat> and we did have a lot of fun, but for a few of us, there was a, a serious undercurrent of real hardcore escapism, um, uh, chaos, like adrenaline junkie stuff, really dangerous behavior. Um, we, like I said, we weren't bad kids. We we still sort of had like the lines we wouldn't cross. We didn't like thieves. We didn't like bullies, stuff like that. But we were doing stuff every other day that could kill us. Um, and a lot of it was like super duper illegal. Uh, and again, nothing mean spirited. It was all sort of um, more self destructive than anything. Although there were some <laughs> outwardly destructive behaviors too. But you don't know until years later when you when you look at it in hindsight that it's uh we were trying anything that we could to escape. And a couple of us didn't really care if we lived or died. There was like a subconscious element of that. Um and I, you know, barely made it through high school. I hated high school. Fortunately, Again, my folks raised me the right way and they just refused to let me fail or drop out. I just wanted to play music. That's all I wanted to do. That's all I've ever wanted to do since I was like 13. Um, but I got through high school. I got a scholarship to go to college in Arkansas. I really didn't even want to do that, but I, I didn't know what else to do. So I did that, went to Arkansas. Uh, and the first day I was there, <laughs> I went down the hall of the dorm I was in trying to find whoever was partying and I found this group of dudes from Benton, Arkansas and it was on man. It was on. I had already, you know, gotten to the point where I was partying a lot, but, uh, once you're completely unsupervised in a different state, it's, it turns into something else. And I did well in school, uh, for the first semester. And then I stopped going, I went to a house show and saw a couple bands so I had I had my friends that were going to school who were my age, and then I went to this house show, saw a couple bands that were killer, uh, and ended up meeting dudes that were a little bit older that were playing in the music scene, and I was right back to just playing music. I I pretty much like handpicked dudes from these two different bands that I saw at the party, started a new band, and that became my life. That became the focus of my life. Uh, I ended up going to a summer school like psychology class crushing it and then just deciding that I didn't want to go to college uh started playing music again and just working that sort of thing went like jumped in with both feet into playing music um also at this point I had jumped in with both feet into drinking whiskey and snorting painkillers, you know, uh, the college kids were the ones that were, it wasn't even really the musicians I was hanging out with. It was like the, the Catholic school girls from Little Rock that were snorting Xanax all day and shit like that. So I was just, okay. Um, alcohol was always my drug of choice, but why not? If we're going to do some Vicodin, let's do some Vicodin. I was getting in a little bit of trouble. Um, But yeah, man, sorry, there's some weird ass noise in the background. I can't figure out what it is. Washing machine, maybe. Anyway, uh, yeah, just like running myself into the ground. And then your late teens, early 20s, you can get away with that. Uh, but at some point it flipped on me. Uh, you know, I'm, I was playing music. I was having fun. There was a certain period in time where my bandmates and I were living in this 
basically haunted like psychedelic freak house out in the middle of nowhere. The closest town was West Fork, Arkansas, but it was really secluded on 33 acres. It was like a Manson family type situation. That was a lot of fun. Drinking and partying and shit was still fun when we were out there. Uh, we moved back into town when that, I'm going to do a whole episode on that haunted West Fork house. And I'm going to try to get somebody to come down that lived there so that we, <laughs> we can talk about it because it's worth a whole episode. Uh, but anyway, after that, moved back to town. Things were getting kind of bleak. Uh, my roommate at the time started shooting up painkillers. Our neighbor showed him how to do that. And our neighbor was selling them. So that's a win-win for him, right? And somehow I avoided that. I just never liked the idea of putting a needle in my arm, which is good. Probably wouldn't be here if I had done that. I've, I've, I'm sure I would have liked it a lot, probably too much. But somewhere around this time, I would say this is like 2008, 9, 10. Alcohol started flipping on me. Um, and it was still fun. But every once in a while, I was waking up thinking, ah, I don't ever want to do that again. Uh, and I just kept doing that again. At this point, we were drinking for free at some of the bars in Fayetteville. Uh, my, buddy, <laughs> my buddy Tim was walking out of work with a case of beer every single night and <laughs> coming to my house. So uh, it was kind of hard to stop, you know. And I'm working a few different jobs. Uh, I was a caregiver for development, de, sorry, developmentally disabled people, developmentally disabled people, and, uh, you know, working in a dish pit and stuff, playing in three, four, five bands. And I, at some point, I just sort of realized this wasn't going anywhere and uh, decided I was going to move to Arizona to go to recording school. I'd have a couple of friends that went there. So I did that, packed up, barely made it out of Arkansas. The last like month or so I was there, I was going really, really, really hard. Uh, I had started throwing up blood at this point. Didn't really see that as a sign that anything should change. Uh, so I did a G, what they call a geographical change. Packed up, moved to Arizona, went to this recording school. The drinking sort of leveled out, but not really. I think the first night I was in Arizona, me and this dude went to a show and he ended up like kicking out a cop's back window <laughs> and went to jail literally on the first night of, of class. You know, I think we, I'd been there like a week, but that was the first night of class. Me and a dude go out and he, he ends up in jail. <laughs> um, so anyway, I finished this recording program, Still drinking, still going hard, maybe not as hard as I was there in the last years of my Arkansas days. Uh, ended up going to California and helping a dude build a studio. And I didn't feel like I belonged in Santa Monica, California, or Malibu, California, for that matter, where I was working. And I had a, I was living with a friend from high school, and we had another buddy come out who uh, has subsequently told me, he's like, dude, I think the first time I realized you had a problem is we woke up after a night of serious drinking and I was living on, I was sleeping on the couch in the house. I was living at. I was like the third wheel in there. Uh, but he said he saw me wake up in the morning and I took a bottle of Evan Williams and turned it up. And when we were having this conversation years later, I was like, Oh yeah, I remember I was taking shots in the morning. He said, dude, you weren't taking shots. You were turning the motherfucker up for a while. Uh, that was first thing in the morning, man. This is 2011 at this point. Keep in mind, I've already been throwing up blood for a couple years now. Uh, really not enjoying the after effects of drinking. And I still got about four years to go. <laughs> so I ended up moving back to Phoenix because of my wife. We're now married. We weren't married at the time, but we ended up getting married, which is cool. A miracle. Uh, when I moved back to Phoenix, I started playing music again, which was cool. 
but that sort of gave me an excuse to keep throwing down hard, you know. The last, let's see, 2012 was the last time that I sort of tried to take a break on my own through my own uh, thinking and my own willpower. I was going to go on tour with Paul Bear, uh, December, 2012. And at some point before that, I was like, well, I know what that's going to be like. <laughs> I know what that tour with Paul Bear is going to do to my body and mind. So let me try to take a month off of drinking, right? That was the goal. And I've always been the type of person that if I set a goal, I'd do it, period. I'll do it or die trying, right? And so I set this goal. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get off alcohol for a month. I made it like two weeks by the skin of my fucking teeth. I mean, like white knuckling, grinding my teeth, made it two weeks without drinking, maybe like even a day short of two weeks. And for some reason, I was like, I did it. That's good enough. The month long thing went out the window, man. And I was right back at it. And 2012 was fucking out of control out of control. There's a lot of people that saw me that year that can attest. I think I was half-assed convinced of the Mayan calendar thing because I had read this Daniel Pinchbeck book. And so I sort of like think, (laughs) I think I halfway convinced myself the world was going to end in December 2012 and I was living accordingly. Um, There were still some fun times in there. That, That was the last year that there was even a glimmer of hope that what I was doing was enjoyable. Uh, 2013 and 2014, I was going through some personal stuff again, uh, pretty traumatic family stuff that I think sort of triggered some old memories and old feelings and a lot of really, uh, embedded psychological and emotional stuff that I had never addressed. Uh, and those, those were the bad years, man. Every single day of 2013 and 2014, I woke up and said, I got to stop today or I'm going to die. And I couldn't. I never did. I started taking Xanax a lot because my idea was that I was going to medically detox myself. Uh, Alcohol withdrawals are, there's two kind of withdrawals that kill you. One is alcohol withdrawals. One is benzo withdrawals. Xanax is a benzo. The irony is that they give you benzos to get off of alcohol. Uh, But I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. I thought I did. I didn't. I would wake up and say, all right, I'm going to take a Xanax so that I don't have a fucking seizure and I don't have full-blown psychotic episode or hallucinations or DTs or something. You know, I would take the Xanax and then I would keep drinking just how I would always drink. At this point, I'm drinking... uh, like a liter of wild turkey 101 every day. I'm selling everything I own. That whole deal. No different than a junkie, you know. Uh, because there is no difference. The the substance is uh the substance is our attempt at treating our condition. The substance isn't the issue, you know, it's a it's a mental, spiritual allergy that we're trying to cure with drugs and alcohol. And that's what I was trying to do. I thought I knew about addiction and alcoholism because I studied abnormal psychology and stuff in in school. And turns out I didn't know shit. So March, well, let's see. End of February, I flew back to Arkansas to hang out with my old drinking buddy who would steal the case case of beer from work every day. And, uh, he was, cooking at the time he was a chef really good cook always was and he couldn't get me to eat man I hadn't been eating for years I any calories and any sugar and any carbs and anything like that I was getting I was getting from alcohol if I was lucky one day I could get like half a sandwich down you know I'm six feet tall at this point I was 130 140 pounds but I looked fat because 
my organs were not able to process all the shit that was going on. So I had, you know, retaining fluids in my face and my cheeks and my jowls. I had a gut because uh, the fluid wasn't, my body wasn't able to process the fluid and stuff. So I, I was like severely underweight, but looked bloated and fat and was turning yellow. And I yeah, went to Arkansas to hang out with this, this buddy of mine, one of my best friends I've ever had, you know, and we burned the fucking town down when I lived in Fayetteville. This was the guy that when we were out, it's like, look out, man. <laughs> And for a dude like this to look at me and cry and say, dude, you got to do something. That was a big turning point. I was in the death process at that point. I was well into the physical death process. I had had a few near-death experiences in my life at this point, but this was the closest that I have ever come to physical death. And it could have been days, it could have been weeks, I don't know, but I was right there. And I had a bandmate in, in Arizona that said when he saw me for the last time before I went on this Arkansas trip, he was convinced it was going to be the last time he would ever see me. Anybody that saw me during that period knows how bad it was. So I got on the plane back to Arizona, which was just, I mean, I cannot describe <laughs> with words what kind of living fucking hell that was being on that plane. Uh, and I, I'll never forget. I was, I had just turned 27 years old. I remember what song I was listening to. I was listening to a song called angel of death, not the slayer one by this band, honey, honey, kind of like old school country bluegrass kind of song talking about the angel of death. And I felt the angel of death, sitting next to me on that plane, man, no bullshit. Uh, and, and I had just turned 27 and I was, I feel bad for whoever actually was sitting next to me on that plane. It was probably a sight to behold. And I couldn't shake this thought of like, you are going to die at 27. Like these other dumb junkie assholes. The only difference is you haven't done shit. Jimi Hendrix died at 27, but he was fucking Jimi Hendrix. Who are you? Who are you? Like I hadn't done anything with my life at that point that I was really proud of uh, or that anyone would care about or remember. You know, all these, I had played in 25 bands at that point. A handful of people gave a shit about anything that I had done up to that point. Um, and, you know, I've subsequently learned not to look for approval outside of yourself but more importantly, I hadn't done anything that I gave a shit about at that point. I thought that I had been working my ass off. I thought that I had been coming up with this great shit and in that cloud of drugs and alcohol, I wasn't able to see that I had not done anything worth a shit in the scheme of what my potential was. Uh, and that plane landed. My wife picked me up. She said, uh, you don't you don't smell like alcohol. You smell like death. And I said, man, fuck this. I'm fucking done with this. I said, take my ass to detox. <laughs> uh, and we took a day. I had no experience with this, man. I had never actually tried to legitimately get sober through the channels that you're supposed to use. Uh, I did have friends in recovery, so I was talking to those people, and I was kind of letting... People know what was going on. And then March 3rd, 2015, sent my wife to CVS to get me a bottle of wild turkey so that I could put enough alcohol in my body that I wouldn't freak out, have a seizure, have a psychotic episode so that I could make it to detox. And I remember guzzling that bottle, pouring it in the toilet, saying that's it. And that was it. I haven't drank since then which is fucking insane. Um, my experience in detox was horrific. It, it sucked worse than anything I've ever done. But that was the most important day of my life. That first day I woke up sober, March 4th, was then the most important day of my life. 
and uh it was horrible man i've had i've had people i've had friends that did the exact same thing that i did and they didn't fucking make it uh alcohol withdrawals will just kill you and i experienced what that felt like uh, there was I, I went to a free detox, so I was in there with the street walkers, real ass junkies. This was not like a place where they send you on intervention or a place that you see advertised, you know, in Malibu or whatever. This was Mesa, Arizona street walkers, uh, and I was no better than any of them at the time. You know, I was in the same fucking boat. I mean, it's exactly where I belonged. It was scary as hell going in there. There was some sort of miscommunication. I guess that the people working there didn't fully understand that I needed medication or I would die. You know, I had a friend tell me, act, eat some food and throw up as much as you can and act as sick as you can so you can go from general intake to a bed. And that's when they'll give you drugs. So I was forcing this weird ass food into my face for six, eight hours, going through DTs, hallucinating, uh, just shaking, you know, uncontrollably. I've, I'll never forget there was a guy, one guy came in running from the cops, covered head to toe in blood. I'm pretty sure that was real. There was a big native dude that went up to the lady at the desk and was screaming repeatedly that he needed a razor and calling her a cunt. Every second, this guy was screaming the word cunt, trying to get a razor. Uh, I'm pretty sure that was real, but it, it was the hardest, most fucked up, most terrifying experience of my entire life, being in there that first day. I almost went home. My wife had to call up there and be like, dude, this, he's going to die if you guys don't give him something. They finally did. Uh, so I got through that experience started doing recovery and I remember hearing early on people saying that they had a year or whatever and just thinking that that was like they might as well be a Martian or something it just seemed so impossible and foreign to me and I take a lot for granted now and I try to remind myself that there was a time in my life where literally the only thing that I wanted was to go a day or an hour or a minute without putting alcohol in my body. That's the only fucking thing that I wanted in my life. Uh, and it, it's been eight years and I have not put alcohol in my body. And if I can do that, anybody can do that. Uh, if there's somebody listening to this that you're feeling like that's something you need to do, and not everybody needs to be sober. Uh, I've tried a lot of different ways of living, and I like this one the best. I, I like being sober the best. And again, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, it has nothing to do with any sort of moral superiority or comparing myself to others or anything like that. It's about wanting to feel okay. That's it. I got fucking completely addicted to alcohol because it made me feel good. And then it made me feel okay. And then it made me feel terrible. If it still made me feel good, I would still be doing it. That's the, that's the only goal that I had going through this whole process was that I just wanted to feel okay. And I feel okay now. Uh, is life perfect? Hell no. Am I perfect? Hell no. Do I struggle in sobriety these past few years, especially? Hell yeah. Have I drank in eight years? No. You know, I, I haven't needed to do that. And it's a fucking miracle, man. It's literally a miracle. And I know that there's some of y'all out there that struggle with it because I talk to you. And you don't have to get to the point that I got to. And you don't have to die. You know, the death rate for addiction and alcoholism is astounding. Uh, 
if you look at it as a terminal illness, which, which I think I do, it's crazy. The numbers are mind boggling. The recovery rate is almost non-existent. Does that mean it's impossible? No. I mean, it's, if you can be as bad off as I was and get to a point where you don't have to do that anymore to get through a day, I'm telling you, man, anybody can do it. You can do it. Uh, so that's it. I hope I'm not neglecting anything. I do want to, um, if this can be the seed to help somebody, then that, that whole experience was worth it, right? I remember when I lived in Arkansas, I want to talk about like planting seeds. Uh, when I lived in Arkansas, the place to go to shows was downtown music in Little Rock. And that place was like Vietnam War of substance abuse. I mean, it was just fucking chaos. You were going to see a fight. You were going to see somebody fall over. Uh, you were going to see somebody do drugs in a way that you could, probably couldn't couldn't have previously imagined. Um, I loved it. It was incredible. Boy, the best venue the United States has ever seen. But in the midst of all that, I had a friend, Heavy Tim. This is a different Tim. Heavy Tim, who was sober. And again, he might as well have been a fucking Martian. I could not wrap my head around a person that could be just like the rest of us. Tim was cool as fuck. Still is. Uh, great guitar player, great taste in music, great dude. Didn't seem out of his element in the midst of all this like debauchery and chaos. And I could not figure out how that was possible. Uh, and even at 18, 19 years old, I took note of that. That stuck in my mind. Heavy Tim, like, man, that dude's cool as fuck. And he hangs out with all of us and he's sober. Like, what is that all about? That was the first seed, man. Uh, so I want to thank thank you, Tim, if you're listening to this. I was so worried that I was going to lose my edge getting sober. You see a lot of people do it. And they turn into Jesus freaks and stuff like that, which is cool. Uh, but I was so concerned. A, I was never going to have any fun anymore, ever. I was convinced of that. And B, I'm going to lose like this the demon in me, you know, like the anti-authority, free thinking, creative, punk rock, outlaw kind of part of my personality. Uh, I was afraid I was going to lose it, you know, but then I started realizing like Waylon Jennings was sober. Joe Walsh was sober. James Hetfield got sober. Uh, these guys that I looked up to growing up, uh, Phil Anselmo was a dude that that blew my mind when I was 14. I saw pictures of him and listened to him on the live record, and I was like, God damn, I want to be like that. James Hetfield, listening to him on Binge and Purge. A lot of drinking, man. A lot of drinking on those Pantera home videos. I started to realize, though, okay, these guys that I worship, when they get older, they're either dead or they're sober or they've spent half of their adult years attempting to get sober. <laughs> so a light kind of went on in my head at that point. Waylon Jennings is badass. He's sober. Buzz from the Melvins is as fucking awesome as it gets, and he's sober. It doesn't seem like these guys lost their edge. They're still cool. Waylon's still super funny in interviews. Buzz is still super funny in interviews, still making great music. So those seeds got planted, and those seeds sort of saved my life, man. I remember reading an interview with Buzz where he said, there's not a problem in the world that you can make better by pouring a bottle of whiskey on it. And when I read that, that shook me to my core. Uh, and th those were sort of guideposts for me that saved my life, man. Like I said, a lot of people die doing what I did, and I don't know why they died and I didn't. It, it bugs me out to think about it. Uh, but for a guy who for a long time didn't give a shit if he lived or died and was almost frustrated and disappointed when I would wake up in the morning and still be alive, I can say truly that I'm grateful to be alive every single day that I wake up. I feel a sense of gratitude, even if there's horrible shit going on in the world and in my life. 
I feel grateful to be alive and to be sober, man. Every day that I wake up alive and sober, I'm psyched. That's a good start to the day because it sure as shit beats the alternative. Um, so there's my story with that, man. That's the last time I'm going to tell it. And I hope somebody heard something that helps them. And if not, that's okay too, because I'm not ever going to do a podcast where I'm just talking about the new Metallica song. So we have a fan question. Uh, I'm going to take a drink of Topo Chico here. Let's see. Uh, Got this via email. Oh, yeah, I should do this too. Like, subscribe, comment. Uh, tell a friend if you think you know somebody that will enjoy this. This is always going to be just like a word of mouth thing. And uh, you guys are going to be the guys that help spread it. And we can build a little community out of this, hopefully, if you're enjoying it. So this is uh, via email from Sean. Hey, Nate, big fan of the new podcast and all you've done with Spirit of Drift. Thank you, Sean. I appreciate that. One of the debates I consistently find myself in is around rhythm sections. My brothers and I usually discuss which ones we think are best, but I'm curious about which ones you think are the most important to a band's sound. Let's look at that distinction. Most important to a band's sound. So that's how I approach this question. Sean continues to say, for us, the first ones that come to mind are a bit obvious. Sabbath, The Who... But I contend that Pantera's rhythm section is the most important in all of metal. I think the combination of Rex and Vinny is their musical foundation, and it's the factor that truly makes them heavy. Can't deny that Daryl's riff writing is a massive chunk of their heaviness as well, but I just have to give my props to the low end of the sound. Interested to hear which rhythm sections you think are most important. Uh, he goes on to shout out Ulthar, too. He t I talked about Majesties last week. He likes that I'm... Talks about Ulthar and how they put two great albums out. I love Ulthar. Ulthar. <laughs> I know those dudes. Um, I talk to Shelby a lot. I talk to Justin a lot. Peacock's a little bit more mysterious, but I love him too. Uh, so yeah, shout out to Ulthar. Okay. Rex and Vinny, I, I definitely don't disagree with that. Part of the reason I love reinventing the steel so much is when the guitars, uh, rhythm guitars drop out and Dime's just soloing. Uh, of course, the first few times you hear those parts, you're going to listen to Dimebag. But eventually you start listening to Rex and Vince, and it is outrageous, man. It's a cross between ZZ Top and Slayer, you know? So yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, phenomenal rhythm section, Rex and Vinny from Pantera. Uh, here's how I'm going to approach this. There's there's levels to this shit. Um. Bill Ward and Geezer Butler, uh, that's one of my favorite drummers and my favorite bass player. However, I don't really look at that as like a traditional rhythm section. That's almost two guys that are like riffing in the stratosphere, going ballistic on their own trip, and sometimes they'll lock up super tight when they need to. But that's more of like a freeform kind of thing. So I look at a rhythm section almost as a traditional rhythm section and, and there's levels to that. Motown sound, that's levels above anything in our world. Uh, if you're playing drums and or bass for James Brown or somebody like that, that's levels above our world. That's a real traditional rhythm section to me. Um, I'm going to shout out the Muscle Shoals Swampers. I don't know if any of you have seen that documentary Muscle Shoals about the uh, maybe the greatest American recording studio. There's Sound City and there's Electric Ladyland, but I got a sweet sweet spot in my heart for Muscle Shoals, man. Uh, if you look at the amount of records that were cut down there, it, it's like it doesn't even make sense, man. Uh, but they had all these white boys playing playing rhythms, man. That uh, I think it was Aretha Franklin. Or somebody, it might have been somebody else. It's been a minute since I saw it, but they showed up expecting a bunch of brothers, you know, because let's be real, like back in the day, that that was the rhythm section. They just had better rhythm, man. 
uh, those Motown guys, and like I said, the James Brown type of dudes. Uh, but you had these these Alabama white boys locked into a fucking groove, man, on so many records. Uh, look up Muscle Shoals, and you'll you'll see what I'm talking about. So I think the Swampers are one of the best rhythm sections ever. Uh, but I feel like this question is sort of more geared towards rock and metal. So I'm going to talk about that. Phil Linnett and Brian Downey from Thin Lizzy. Uh, once again, we're talking about what's important to the sound, right? Crucial. I think Brian Downey is the most underrated rock drummer ever, maybe. He's up there... To me, with Ginger Baker and John Bonham and all those guys. Uh, my sort of go-to answer here that's, I guess, could be considered left field or a little unexpected, Tim Comerford and Brad Wilk from Rage Against the Machine. That is a fucking rhythm section, man. That's uh, and important to the sound of that band. I'm going to do like 10 of these. So <laughs> you know I can't just mention a few. Dusty Hill and Frank Beard from ZZ Top. Pretty obvious. Noel Redding and Mitch Mitchell, Jimi Hendrix experience. Again, they're not so much a traditional rhythm section. They're kind of got more of the freeform thing going on. Here's a good one. Rudy Sarzo and Tommy Aldridge. Uh, they played together as Ozzy's rhythm section and were also in White Snake together. They might have even done something else together. A few things. Steve Harris and Nico from Iron Maiden. You know it. Steve is the driving force behind that band. And those dudes really lock up. Getty and Neil from Rush. Cliff Williams and Phil Rudd, ACDC. That's a pocket, man. That's an old school type of pocket I'm talking about. Motown and stuff like that. Next level. You think it's simple. It's simple. It ain't easy. <laughs> Believe me. Here's one that uh, I really think qualifies for the, quote, most important criteria here. Ray Manzarek and John Dinsmore from The Doors. There's not another rhythm section like that, man. No bass. There is bass on L.A. Woman, though, actually, and that's my favorite Doors album. And my last entry here is going to be a more modern-ish band. Troy Sanders, Bron Daler from Mastodon. You listen to those records, those guys are as integral to the sound of that band as any element of that band. Uh, and I've watched all those making of documentaries that they have. I think it goes as far back as Blood Mountain. There might be one for Leviathan too. But um, Bron Daler, I think, might be the m best metal drummer. You know, it's always the conversation is always going to be either him or Hoagland or Lombardo. People bring up Vinnie Paul sometimes too, but Bron Daler is definitely the best drummer of an entire generation for our style of music. And Troy is, I don't think Troy is overlooked at this point. I think people finally have figured out how great that dude is. Uh, but the two of them together, really important to the sound of that band and really astounding stuff. So thanks for the question, Sean. If, uh, if any of you listeners have questions or comments or concerns you want me to address, send them over to bigriffenergy at gmail.com. Thanks. All right, I didn't get to talk about this record last week, Linda Ronstadt, Heart Like a Wheel. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail because I've already gone pretty significantly over this episode. Uh, I always consider myself a guitar player, first and foremost. And it wasn't until I started doing Spirit of Drift that I really, I, I would say it wasn't even until Divided by Darkness that I really tried to look at vocals with the same microscopic obsession that I had with guitar when I was learning guitar back when I was like 13. Uh, Linda Ronstadt's vocals are unparalleled in the world of popular music you know there's there's levels that i'm not even ever going to explore like opera and stuff like that i'm there's no point in me trying to study 
stuff like that cuz I'll never I'll never be there. Uh but you know around divided by darkness I started studying real legit vocalists. Um there's a few of those type of people in the metal world. You know, I think Bruce Dickinson's one. I would say Phil Anselmo is one. Halford Dio real vocalists, like students of the craft, you know. Um, but I started sort of venturing outside of our world and studying people like George Jones and Dwight Yoakam. Uh, you know, lately it's been Tyler Childers. Uh, really figuring out like the physical mechanism behind some of the more acrobatic stuff and the more dynamic stuff and precise stuff and uh, really delivering like a bombastic but controlled vocal performance. And she's the best. Linda Ronstadt's the best. It's taken me a while to get into her. Uh, I saw the documentary that CNN made about her and was just blown away. You know, even as a, a very young woman, the sort of insight and clarity that she had in her view of the music business and what it meant to be famous and what it meant to be a rocker and what it does to people, how it just destroys people. Um, I was so impressed, like watching that old interview footage of her and let's not even talk about watching that old live footage of her just doing stuff that I couldn't even wrap my head around, man. Dominating the rock charts, dominating the country charts, dominating the R&B charts all at the same time, out singing everybody in an era where singer songwriters and vocalists that was like the peak era of that stuff and she's just crushing everybody and so humble about it um and then went on to do opera <laughs> no big deal and then went on to do uh the music of her heritage you know traditional mexican music which is like maybe even harder and just completely dominating every vocal style that she that she attempted uh I love Linda Ronstadt, man. And then she's kind of having a resurgence now because they did the the Last of Us episode, which was killer. I actually like that album, uh, Silk Purse, the one with her and all the pigs on it. I need to get that one. But Heart Like a Wheel is cool. It's really good. It's a little more like mainstream sounding. Silk Purse is more of like a country album. Uh, but the song to check out on this one is Willing. That is a... That is a great song. Uh, so yeah, that's my thoughts on Linda Ronstadt and Heart Like a Wheel. Check out that song, Willing. It's really good. Uh, and thanks for tuning in, man. That's it. That's all I got. And I will be here more than likely on Thursday for a new episode. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.